All right. We are in the last four hours of this 24-hour marathon. Um, Ashish Shah is going to be talking about acute talus fractures and cuboid fractures. Uh, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Salin, for the introduction. And I'm Ashish Shah. We, the whole session is with Jason Oero, Paul Ryan, Swap Singh. Jason and Paul, I went to the fellowship together at UAB. And Jason, at this point, working as assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Houston Methodist. Paul Ryan, he's a faculty at Lake Tahoe Sports Medicine Fellowship Program, associate professor at University of Nevada, Reno. And he practices at the beautiful town, South Lake Tahoe in California. And Swapnil, he's my current fellow, and he's going to start practicing in New York City by the 1st of the August. Thank you so much, everybody. And I will hand over to Jason. Thank you so much, Ashish. Uh, Celine, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and uh, present to you guys uh, from uh, warm uh, and humid uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, I've been tasked with talking to you today about talus fractures, techniques and tips for fixation. This is a little bit more didactic uh, to kind of kick off our case uh, presentations. Uh, so uh, hopefully most of this is review, but uh, we'll get to it. I have no conflicts of interest related to this presentation. So our objectives today are to understand the anatomy of the talus, surgical approaches for the talus fracture, and options for fixation of both tailor neck and body fractures. In terms of the anatomy of the talus, it's approximately 60 to 70 percent covered by articular cartilage. There's essentially no muscular attachments. Uh, multiple ligamentous attachments are there. The articulations are complex, uh, articulating with both the subtalar joint, tibia talar joint, and the talar navicular joint. And if you think about the anatomy, we know that the neck of the talus deviates medially, and this is really important when it comes to fixation of these fractures in order to prevent uh, malunion. In terms of the blood supply of the talus, we know that the artery of the tarsal canal, which rises off the posterior tibial artery, uh, is probably the most important uh, component as it supplies the majority of the talar body. The deltoid artery uh, is also important in that it supplies the medial talar body and often in severe fracture dislocations, this may be the only remaining blood supply uh, in a displaced uh, fracture. The anterior tibial artery supplies the head and neck. Uh, the perforating perineal via the artery of the tarsal sinus provides some minor vascularity to both the head and neck as well. In terms of the mechanism of injury with the tailor neck fracture, typically these are high energy injuries. So you're talking your motor vehicle collisions or fall from height. Usually there's a forced dorsiflexion injury such as um, you know, slamming on a brake pedal. Um, usually there's uh, associated injuries to the lower extremity as, off, as well as um, you know, head and neck injuries uh, such as in a motor vehicle accident. Tailor fractures can be divided into fractures of the tailor neck, fractures of the tailor body, Taylor head fractures, as well as the extruded talus, which we'll touch on briefly. Hawkins was the first to describe a classification of Taylor neck fractures, and really his classification system was designed to be somewhat prognostic in terms of avascular necrosis risk. Hawkins 1 fractures is a non-displaced fracture with which carries somewhere 0 to 13% uh, AVN risk. With a Hawkins 2 fracture, there's actually a subluxation or dislocation of the subtalar joint. And we see that our AVN risk uh, begins to climb there, although typically with these, you do have preservation of that deltoid uh, branch that supplies the medial body. As we progress to Hawkins 3 and 4 fractures, obviously these are much more severe uh, with uh, much higher AVN rates um, with a th Hawkins 3 fracture involving both a subtalar and tibiotalar dislocation uh, and a Hawkins 4, including a tailor navicular uh, dislocation on top of that. Uh, again, with Hawkins, type 1 fractures typically disrupt the anterolateral blood flow, which again is a minor contribution. Uh, you still have your body perfused, and so AVN typically is not a huge issue with these. Uh, again, with the type 2, medial flow is preserved, hopefully, uh, with the deltoid branch. Uh, but as you get into type 3 and type 4, essentially all of these um, uh, contributing uh, vessels are disrupted. So really what constitutes a talus emergency? This, this uh, topic has been somewhat controversial over the years and um, you know, it used to be this was a fracture that had to go immediately. I think in general it's uh, pretty accepted now that this is probably one that can wait uh, till morning with few exceptions. So 
uh, an irreducible dislocation or an open fracture, um, depending on the severity uh, and associated injuries, you know, potentially that's something that, you know, necessitates emergent intervention. Um, and then closed fractures that have uh, soft tissue or neurovascular structures that are compromised, such as, you know, this fracture here with a Taylor body that's extruded post-remedially, you may see that somebody coming in with more of an acute tarsal tunnel uh, picture or potentially at worst case scenario, uh, you know, vascular compromise. Chell et al., uh, FAI, back in 2005, uh, did a survey study of uh, foot and ankle experts and trauma experts around the country. And uh, basically, the consensus was that quality reduction is probably more important than timing um, unless there was neurovascular compromise. And so, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that this, the, these fractures can probably wait till morning. But, um, you know, uh, when, when, you have a, when you have your team and uh, uh, necessary uh, implants and so forth available. So go what are the goals of open reduction? So just like any articular fracture, it's restoration of anatomy. We want to make sure we realign the tailored neck, uh, avoid varus or valgus, uh, and we want to maximize revascularization if possible. We want stable fixation that will allow for early range of motion. This is really important to uh, achieving a good functional outcome for the patient. In terms of approaches, standard approaches or the uh, workhorse would be the anteromedial and the anterolateral approach. Uh, often this is combined as dual approaches, although Dr. Ryan is going to talk to us in a bit about a single approach to the tailor neck. Um, frequently uh, for, uh, you know, severe dislocations where the body is extruded posteriorly, um, a malleolar osteotomy can be uh, helpful, or if you've got a severe tailor dome fracture that uh, requires uh, anatomic reduction of the dome, uh, medial malleolar osteotomy is helpful. Likewise, if the lateral body is uh, displaced and depressed, um, uh, the fibular osteotomy can also be utilized. So again, this would be a representation of uh, where these incisions would be for both the anterolateral and anteromedial approach. You see you have a pretty safe skin bridge uh, in between the two incisions that allows you to approach uh, both without risk of uh, uh, necrosing the uh, intermediary tissue. And this would be a view of uh, when, when we're actually open here, you can see that uh, often we have medial comminution there. And so uh, getting a really good visualization of that medial comminution, uh, you can see uh, you've got more than enough um, real estate here to place uh, plate fixation if needed. So in terms of surgical plans, uh, as I said, you should usually consider dual exposures. Um, interoperative uh, distractor and external fixator is really uh, critical in these fractures to allow for distraction so you can uh, visualize. Um, in general, you want to clean the subtalar joint off, and there's a lot of comminuted fragments in the subtalar joint that need to be uh, uh, removed. Um, and then you want to find cortical keys. And again, like most fractures, there's a tension and a compression side. Tension sides are usually amenable to um, anatomic reduction and compressive fixation, whereas uh, uh, the uh, compression side is usually comminuted and may need to be spanned with a plate. Um, this is another uh, situation of a fracture that uh, the mantra, thou shalt not varus, is really important. And so because of these uh, medial com uh, tendency toward medial comminution, um, you know, if you do compress that side and, and get varus, you can uh, get a pretty significant uh, malunion of that talus, which uh, can result in a rigid cave of varus deformity, which is uh, not ideal. Um, so again, uh, we talked about uh, reduction to compress fixation along the uh, tension side um, and avoiding of shortening by spanning combination. Um, in terms of fixation principles, so uh, screws placed posterior and anterior are typically more biome biomechanically sound than A to P screws. Sometimes uh, certain fracture patterns, um, you know, it's just easier to get an ADP screw, um, you know, but you won't, you may sacrifice a little bit of the uh, uh, fixation strength. Um, in terms of uh, for spanning combination, um, you know, it used to be uh, training, we would use mini fragment plates, sometimes mini fragment blade plates for this. Uh, nowadays, uh, many, many companies have modern uh, anatomic uh, tailor neck plates. Uh, uh, which I, I tend to favor now for these combinated fractures. Typically, your best bone on these fractures is going to be in the lateral aspect of the tailor head as well as the infralateral tailor body. Um, and that's been uh, shown in a couple of studies. In terms of uh, screw fixation options, usually these are, uh, I prefer cannulated screws. So uh, 3.5, 3 4.0, uh, even 4.0. 
4.5 could be used uh, for smaller dome fractures. Uh, you may need to use a much smaller um, uh, screw fixation for that. Um, you can use uh, partial or fully threaded screws, uh, depending on uh, if you need uh, compression uh, versus just to maintain length. Um, you know, with headed screws, we used to have to countersink these. Nowadays, I tend to use a lot more headless compression screws, uh, which uh, obviate the need for uh, countersinking. Um, so for a link stable fracture uh, such as this, again, this can be treated with, with an RF uh, with all, all screw fixation plus some mini fragment screws for fixation of the dome fracture. And so when the length is unstable, again, this is where plate fixation can be used. And these are kind of your plate options. Again, they, this have evolved a lot uh, as uh, our plate technology has gotten better and, and now using more anatomic uh, neck plates. Um, and so yeah, you can see some of the older older renditions of what we would use off the mini fragment set. Nowadays, this is an example of kind of a modern uh, neck plate, which can be utilized. Um, and so again, for a common in neck fracture, this would be a situation where sometimes dual medial and lateral plating can be uh, utilized uh, to help maintain that length. You really can't uh, compress across this fracture successfully without, you know, creating some sort of shortening on one side or the other. Um, and so uh, here's an example, uh, again, of uh, one where there was lateral comminution here, which uh, required a plate fixation plus a stable cortical key um, on the, on the uh, tension side, which happened to be medial in this case, uh, which was able to be fixed with the uh, screw fixation there. And so in terms of outcomes of these fractures, um, a lot of the a lot of the early work and some of the best work, I think, has been done uh, by uh, Valier and uh, her group out of Harborview. Um, they've uh, published uh, uh, their results and outcomes of their series of both tailored neck and tailored body fractures. Um, and uh, what they found uh, in their series was that up to 49% uh, of uh, their tailor neck fractures showed some evidence of osteonecrosis with 63% of those showing collapse. Um, and then if you do the math on this, basically it was 31% of all their neck fractures resulted in AVN with collapse. Um, and 54% actually developed uh, post-traumatic arthritis. Uh, they found that surgical delay was not really correlated with increased risk of AVN, which you know further supports our ability to delay these. Um, they found that comminution and open fractures uh, increase both the risk of AVN and subtalar arthritis, uh, which is uh, what you may expect. Uh, Sanders uh, published his uh, functional outcome study back in uh, JOT in 2004, uh, looking at his outcomes after displaced uh, tailor neck fractures and found that up to 30, 37% of these require secondary surgical procedures. So these are fortunately the gift that keeps on giving in uh, many cases. Um, they found that secondary procedures increased with the amount of time, and they found that worse functional results um, occurred when there was mal malunion or uh, development of subtalar arthritis. He actually found that Dave Astor uh, necrosis risk was low um, in, in, his, in his study. So switching gears a little bit to tailored body fractures. So uh, these fractures basically occur posterior to the lateral tailor process, and they involve both the tibia tailor and subtalar joint. Typically, a surgical tactic in terms of treating these, uh, visualization, just like any fracture, is key. Um, typically, these are going to require multiple exposures, uh, including uh, you know, possibly a, a malleolar osteotomy. Um, you really want to pre-op plan, so have uh, good CT um, uh, imaging available on these fractures. And then, again, a distract uh, distractor can be, uh, you know, critical in terms of getting these reduced and uh, um, uh, back, uh, back aligned. Um, in terms of tailored dome fractures, again, uh, another one where um, medial malleolar osteotomy is critical for a depressed medial dome, uh, being able to get that articular surface uh, anatomically relied, uh, aligned and fixated. Uh, here, you know, headed screws were used, but again, this is another one where um, I think a headless compression type screw would be uh, uh, optimal. And again, for a lateral body fracture, um, a lateral malleolus osteotomy uh, can, can be really critical for visualization. Um, in terms of when Bellier and their group looked at surgical treatment of tailored body fractures, they found that their uh, osteonecrosis risk was about 38% here, and it was usually evident within about 10 months. Um, they found that 50% of these um, showed collapse, so a little bit uh, higher collapse rate uh, with the body fractures. In terms of uh, arthritis, I think that was what was most staggering with the uh, 
body fractures that they found 65% uh, developed tibia tailor arthritis and 35% developed subtalar arthritis with end stage arthritis occurring in 20, uh, both joints in about 23% of their study group. So obviously these uh, fractures have a lot of morbidity to them. Um, again, open fractures and then fractures uh, that were combined, uh, body fractures combined with a neck fracture um, definitely had uh, more um, uh, risk of arthritis in their, in their series. And only about 12% of, of these body fractures had uh, neither osteonecrosis or arthritis. So again, uh, you know, very poor prognosis with these. So in summary, Taylor, Taylor body fractures do poorly. Open fractures do worse. Uh, the fracture pattern uh, really dictates the approach. Um, osteonecrosis doesn't necessarily uh, equal a, a bad result. Um, and arthritis is obviously common and probably the biggest risk with these. Uh, lastly, we'll wrap up with Taylor extrusions. Um, I don't I don't see many of these nowadays as I'm not at a, a level one center, but obviously these uh, you know were thought to be catastrophic injuries. Um, if you're fortunate enough uh, to uh, have the patient come in where they actually have their talus with them, um, you know the even though the blood supply to the bone has been disrupted, uh, common thinking is uh, that you ought to at least uh, give them a shot at replanting it if you can get the uh, joint clean enough. Um, and, you know, even if they do get some avascular necrosis, having that bone stock, um, you, know, you know, historically is thought to be better. Um, again, um, you would think that an infection would be a really uh, major risk with these, although the infection has not been found, um, you know, in previous studies to really be a huge issue with these. And so I, I guess I would encourage you to uh, consider replantation of the talus now. That being said, uh, with the advent of some of the new uh, 3D printed uh, custom uh, taluses and things, you know, I do think that that you know is potentially going to be an option uh, for those that uh, don't don't have their talus uh, in hand that was left out in the highway, um, you know, an antibiotic spacer, and then as a bridging procedure until um, you know they could uh, have a 3D printed talus. Um, you know, I think that's going to become more commonplace in the future. Uh, just in general, in terms of post-op, so we try to uh, start active and uh, active ankle and subtalar range of motion really as soon as uh, wounds are healed. Typically, we keep these non-weight bearing for eight to twelve weeks, um, and depending on the fracture, possibly a little bit earlier weight bearing. But I'm a little conservative with these uh, routine radiographs, um, and um, even if you are seeing some sign of AVN, um, you know, as we still typically would uh, want to consider increasing their weight bearing. So in summary, these are difficult fractures. There's no single uh, uh, optimal treatment method. I think you have to uh, take every fracture for itself. Um, prompt treatment, uh, though not emergent usually. Um, you want an accurate reduction with rigid fixation to our early motion. AVN is common, but not always symptomatic. Uh, and virtually all of these are articular, so your arthritis risk is going to be the most common complication. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time. Paul, if you want to take control there. Yeah, I'll take control. Um, I think she said something, but I think you're still on, on mute. All right. Uh, hey, I'm Paul Ryan. Um, uh, she's giving me a thumbs up if I am live and you can hear me. Good, good. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Ashish and Celine, for having me. Uh, we'll switch gears for a quick second, and I'll talk about a couple of cases I've had here in Lake Tahoe um, this last year. And um, then I'll kind of talk about my approach to Taylor neck fractures uh, here on the ski slope. Um, so I'll start with this kid. Um, this is one of my patients who, let me see, oops, I didn't advance it, uh, who is in interested in working in a winery. And so he's spending the summer working in the wine fields, you know, actually doing the manual labor. Uh, so he understands the whole aspect of the business. Um, and he was up on top of one of the sheds that they were working on, uh, and he fell 15 feet. Um, luckily, isolated injury, and um, uh, he has friends with uh, people up here in Tahoe, and so I got a call from them that said, you know, hey, we're, we're sending uh, our son up to, to see you there in Lake Tahoe, where you guys take care of the ski team. So um, isolated injury, evaluated in emergency room, uh, and came up to see me with this injury. Um, so... Um, you know, I'd say, um, you know, for any guys in the panel, you know, what, 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 what are you gonna do next? Here's a, a typical X-ray images, AP, mortis, and lateral view, uh, X-rays coming up, and now, uh, what's the next imaging study that you guys go for? 
Yeah, so personally, I mean, it looks to me like he's got uh, kind of a comminuted lateral dome fracture there, Paul. Um, I definitely would want a CT of this to uh, further evaluate. I agree. I mean, this is, a, I don't really have a big role for MRI uh, in these. If they came in dislocated, I feel that I'd be able to evaluate that intraoperatively. So for me, CT is my study uh, to evaluate that. And, you know, I don't have a, I didn't want to throw a video into this thing and, and cause complications. So I, I threw in a sample of the lateral up the top left. Um, then you have an axial and a coronal view. Um, and so you can see we have, you know, decent comminution. I think for a, you know, young man who's active into sports and has his whole life ahead of him, I think those pieces are large and need to be dealt with. Um, uh, so, you know, I don't know, maybe Ashish, I don't know if you want to jump in and Talk about how you might how you might address this. Do you, you can do a lateral osteotomy, um, uh, or what's your approach to this guy? Uh, that's a great question. Like you know, so I was about to ask you a question: Which cases do you do X fix first and CT scan versus you? I mean, this case we just did CT scan directly. I mean, there are certain. Yeah. Uh huh. Please. Yeah, so for me, I don't X fix somebody unless I think their cartilage is at risk or their skin is at risk. Um, okay. And so if they're fairly well reduced and the talus is under the tibia, under the plafond, um, then I don't think that X fix you know, is, is necessary. But if they are unstable ankle fracture and associated with the talus fracture or they have cartilage or skin at risk, that might be someone I would take to X fix first. Got it. So for this one, definitely, like, you know, uh, as we see that it's more lateral, right? So we need to go more. Uh, what I will do, instead of just jumping over the osteotomy, I would start doing the anterolateral approach for this patient and see that how much I'm able to access here, you know? And number of times anterolateral, you can access pretty much up to the body. We'll be amazed like in my plantar flexion of the ankle. And sometimes with the pin distractor, you are able to access without the osteotomy, but it's not the similar when we go medially. So I will just start like, you know, more of anterolateral approach, see how much I'm able to access with the uh, pin distractor. Yeah, I agree. And that's that. And that's how I approach it. I think with the anterolateral approach, as long as you bring it up to the fibula, you can always do a fibular osteotomy uh, if you can't get enough exposure. You know, there's nothing that limits you from doing that as long as you have your approach in the right direction. So in this one, I started off with a very similar approach that I might make for um, a brostrum uh, and extended it. And so- um, You take your ligaments uh, directly I, off the fibula, Paul? Yeah, so I, I do what's called a reverse brostrum, as you can see. So I just, um, I take the ligaments up as high on the fibula as I can, as if I'm doing a brostrum, and I go and take them off. I, I expose the perineals, I take the CFL, I take the ATFL, um, and I release them off and I have those. Brostrums are highly successful. You can, you know, we have 95% success rate now with brostrums. And so I'm not worried at all about taking those lateral ligaments. And once you take those lateral ligaments off, you can really almost dislocate this ankle out the anterior lateral aspect of the plafond. And, and like as she said, now I'm gonna use an external fixator. Uh, I'll try to use a pin. This is just a Hinterman uh, type of device. Um, and you could use a more advanced external fixer if you needed to, uh, and I'll get more exposure. And I, I can see, almost like she said, I can almost see the whole talus at this point. I can do everything I need to do. Uh, once you have that exposure, um, now you can fix, reconstruct, do what you need to do. I think how you fixate it doesn't really matter. Um, in the day, uh, in this day and age of biocomposite screws, I prefer those. I you can, metal screws are great, but you'll see them and they always look very close to your articular margin in later x-rays. And if they, they develop arthritis, um, then you're always wondering, was well, my screw proud? Should I take it out? But with the HA screws, I, I, I like those a lot better. I know they're a little more expensive, um, but I'll use the HA screws. Um, and then I'll use chondral darts. Chondral darts, I know is a proprietary um, uh, item, but I would say that for chondral darts, you just have to be careful. And I think anyone who uses them knows they're not perfect. Uh, I will drill them three times and I'll kind of jiggle a little bit as I drill them. Because if you ever use them and they don't go in perfectly, they will sit proud. And then you're taking a ronger and you're like, what did I just do? I had the smaller articular piece that I now have rongered off to get this dart out. So um, 
I, my technique for those, I drill three times and I jiggle a little bit as I drill. Um, and that way when I pass those, those darts in, uh, they're going to not be proud. They're going to go where they need to go. Uh, and then after that, it's just a matter of repairing the ligaments. So it's a pretty easy escape from this. So, uh, Paul, the um, question to you is two questions. Number one, number of times this biocomposite screw, PMA screws, you, you can get the inflammatory reaction. You know, have you mm -hmm. seen come across that? That's number one. And number two, what do you do? Like, there are a number of times when you're opening that are wafer-sized thin pieces of the cartilage. Uh, how do you address yeah. that? Do you do, what, what do you do for those defects? Yeah, so not in this case. These pieces were pretty decent, but I've had that where I go into repair a talus uh, with cartilaginous fragments where I think there's going to be enough bone. And I'm like, wow, there's no way. I mean, my screw is going to be in cartilage. Um, I use fiber and glue. So I just, uh, I literally will, I prepare the defect and you always need to prepare it more than you think. Um, because if you leave any kind of hematoma, your cartilage is going to sit proud and offset. And so I prepare it such that it will sit countersunk because I can always adjust that with fiber and glue. And then I will just put fiber and glue into the defect and I will literally, my, my incision's good enough where I can put a thumb or a freer and I can hold my, my piece reduced until that glue hardens. And if I need more glue or I need to let it set a little bit to get it about flush, I can do that. So I'm a fiber and glue guy. I will glue inside the defect. If I can, I'll still throw a couple of uh, you know, kind of dart uh, type devices in there. Um, and uh, But I'm fiber and glue in that case. And I've been very happy with uh, gluing these things back together with fiber and glue. Yep. Uh, does any of you guys have, I, I came across, I think it's more of the, some, it's been popularized in Europe or South America, some hemi implant for the talus. I mean, any any of the implant that you had taken out or put it in? Not here. I mean, not, not in the acute setting. I mean, you know, I've done some, you know, bulk hemi allograft um, uh, taluses, um, but no, not not from not, not any kind of metallic implant or anything. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, yeah not here either. Yes. Um, and so, um, you know, I uh, this is him, uh, hard films, and um, he had some deltoid laxity as well, which I found out after the case was kind of chronic for him. Um, but I went ahead and, and fixed both sides, but he's done well. Uh, so he's a year out now. He's back to mountain biking. He was never a runner, so I can't really judge his running. Um, but he's back to work, no instability, um, and feels good and feels that he's recovered from this uh, this injury. So uh, x-rays still, you can see where the injury was. Um, but I imagine, I don't do a second look MRI or second look uh, scope unless there's a problem. Uh, I imagine that he has a nice cartilage layer over that. And um there's no cystic formation, so I think he did really well with this. Okay. All right. Um, so I will go on to my next uh, case. Um, so lateral process. I know uh, Jason kind of covered the big ones, and then you know Taylor's. We have all these little tiny things, like I just showed. So the lateral process, often thought to be the snowboarder's uh, fracture, and so I have a guy who would challenge that. So um, he came into my clinic. He's a ski jumper, and so if you're not a uh, not into the ski and snowboard team, this is a trucker. His this kid's doing a full trucker right here. He's he's upside down and backwards grabbing his skis. Um, but my patient landed with both skis out and uh, everted and um, sustained an injury. And um, so I'll I'll tell the fellow, you know, um, you know, you're looking at a lateral, and, and just so you know, you're looking at a lateral process fracture. You can look at that subtalar joint, and things look a little bit awful. Um, but you can't quite tell. So hopefully this is a, just a softball. What, what, what's your next study? What are you, you going to order on this guy? I mean, uh, swap now, please. Wait, I'm, I'm going to... Sorry, swap now. I was asking you. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm probably do the CD scan because, uh, yeah, I can see that it is sublux for sure. I mean, uh, but it's difficult because it's not too lateral. Uh, probably because of the, you can't see the tailor, uh, tibia tailor joint. Uh, so I can't see the sinus very well, <clears throat> see the fracture of the uh, lateral process of the talus as well. Yeah, so the next study will be the CT scan to better characterize it. 
Great. So I got a CT scan. Um, and, and as it always is, it's, it's worse than you expect. It's never that, never that piece that you see in the textbooks where the lateral process broke off and someone put a screw in it. It's always a little bit awful. And you're always questioning, can I make it better? So what do you think, uh, Swap? Now, you're going you're gonna to go after this one? You're going to tell them, hey, your joint's open. Let's just let it consolidate. Maybe need a fusion or an excision later. What do you think about this CT scan? Um, young athlete, 28 years old. Yeah, looking at it, I uh, feel it's uh, really very difficult to fix it. If it is a single piece, a single screw is really a, a way to go fix uh, this kind of fracture. Um, normally what I do, I will open this, uh, go, I will go through the sinus stratosi approach, like making a little bit of uh, dorsal approach and see the fracture. If it is not redu reducible, I will just excise it and um, I will see the stability of the uh, uh, subtalar joint. Normally these patients, uh, if they have the subtalar dislocation, they need a pinning uh, in the subtalar joint for like six weeks. and. Um, uh, depending on the ligament situation, how the intra-op uh, um, stability of the ankle joint is, uh, if they need repair of the lateral ankle ligament, I will go ahead and do that. So in this situation, I think uh, excision versus uh, I try to fix it, uh, subtalar pinning, and look at the stability of the joint, subtalar and the tibialis joint. Oh, how big I do you yeah, think I had a, how like how big is too big to actually excise where you really have to try to figure out something fix it um depending on the combination you know having getting a good read is very difficult yeah so that's that's my idea like if i'm not getting a good read it's not fixable i cannot put like even two way screw then i'll probably excise it yeah yeah that's an interesting point about pinning the stuff here that joined this i've uh I've always gone for repair in motion. Are are you guys pinning these, the, the calcaneus to the talus for six weeks, let it consolidate? Yeah, so I, I mean, yeah, it's it's pretty debatable topic, right? Whom you are treating. So it's instead of making the generalized statement that I do always do, I would say depending upon the how much combination there, how much instability, how much fragment that I'm excising, uh, I, th that's what I look for it. And I agree, like, you know, that number of times it looks pretty decent sized piece, but by the time you're trying to make it with, even with the two O screw or one seven screw, it will start falling apart or fracturing, you know? I've seen my, some of my trauma partners also putting tiny plate on it, like buttress plating type of thing. In the yeah. past, I have done the, what we call snap off screw as well. So, or, or possible some repairing with the suture material as well. So, yeah, but it's, it's, it's hard. Like what I, I definitely do the K bar fixation across the subtalar joint if it's unstable, if I smooth pin fixation. I'll consider that. Uh, so yeah, I, um, I went after this one. I, I tell you when I, I used to think when there's very accommodated that I just couldn't get it. And I was like, all right, let's just let it consolidate. And if it bugs you, I'll take it out. And if it doesn't, you know, and if you get arthritis, we'll fuse that. But they all did terrible. If I if I didn't fix this, I can't think of a single person who I didn't fix that came back and said, I feel great, Doc. I'm so glad you didn't fix me. Um, and so I've gone to fixing these. Um, and so, uh, like you mentioned, tiny little screws, um, each little fragment gets its own little piece. and. Um, um, put them all back together if I can, a sinus tarsi approach. If I need to use Hintrim, I will. Um, and um, this guy, it's only a one-year outcome, um, but he's back to running and skiing and, and is really happy with it. A um, little bit of a literature on that. There's just not a lot out there. There's classification systems, simple comminuted or chip fracture, um, and there's just not much to guide you. Uh, we generally say about two millimeters of displacement is an indication to go after surgery. Um, and uh, these are some of the bigger series, the, a more recent study uh, with 22 patients that said, hey, if they're easy ones, um, you know, <laughs> then they'll do better. And then of course the classic study with 20 patients is our biggest one uh, that said, hey, if we looked at our surgical patients versus our non-operative patients, our so surgical patients did better. And so I, I think my conclusion on these is have a very low threshold 
to go after them. Uh, they are hard fractures. They are tiny. Um, but we have no good literature that suggests leaving them alone does well. And so if you can fix them, I'd say trust in your ability to use tiny screws and small plates and uh, go after them. So, so quick question to you before we wrap up the Taylor uh, lateral process fracture. Uh, number one, does do you factor in age? Like you know, if the same patient was like 60 years old versus this, when you are going behind this fracture. And second is, would like to learn from you what type of hardware or the all the stuff you will keep in your kitchen sink when you're fixing this fracture? Yeah, I don't have a lot in my kitchen sink. I um, I have my mini frag, the modern okay. mini frag, which is gonna have your 1.4 to 2.0. Um, and then I'll have my headless compression, uh, which the smallest I have is 2.0. Um, that I, that I have available. Uh, age, not so much. I think it's more uh, more eyeball on the patient. I mean, here I, I have, I got 60 year old patients who are, you know, downhill skiing and going through moguls. And so age isn't really a big factor for me, but um, if they're a household ambulator, you know, I might not go after it. Makes sense. Okay. I would say, yeah, sheesh, my, my, uh, my population is a lot older. And so I've got a low threshold to actually to be the devil's advocate here, treat them non-surgically just because osteoporosis is pretty rampant in my population and these are not satisfying at all. Um, so I'll let them try to consolidate and if I've got to go back in later and fix size or, or even fuse their subtalar joint, um, I feel like that's, you know, sometimes a better option for them. No, that's great. No, thank you. Uh, swap thank you. That's a great case. Yeah. Yep. So Swapnil right. will be presenting on about the cuboid and it's also case based. So we'll just go over the only couple of cuboid fracture uh, like cases here. Please swap now. So you can take everyone. Yep. Hello everyone. I'm Swapnil Singh. I'm uh, currently doing fellowship uh, at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, and I'm going to talk about this uh, cuboid fracture. Uh, these are the isolated cuboid fracture, which are fairly rare because most of the time cuboid fracture are associated with the chopart or list frying fracture dislocation. Uh, also, the stress fracture of the cuboid are also described in literature, uh, fairly common in uh, athletes, uh, sports person, and professional dancers. Uh, there have been some case series and reports about the uh, young women who had the high risk of the stress fracture because of the osteopenia. So here I'm going, uh, here's my first case. So this was, uh, so this was a 79 year old female. Uh, she had a history of uh, like ankle sprain treated outside hospital for like four months. She was given cash, she was given boot, but she continued to have pain, could not recover from that. And she came to our office. Um, she had BMI of 24 and she was diabetic. Yeah, you okay? I, I can I can move your slide swap now. Oh, you can move. Okay, yeah, it's absolutely so, fine. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So, so on examination, uh, she had pretty uh, classical tenderness over the cuboid, <clears throat> and uh, we were having the suspicion of the uh, the stress fracture of the cuboid. We also had suspicion of the stress fracture of the anterior process of calcaneus. So, uh, since patient basically failed the conservative management, uh, we went ahead and we advised the, um, like we try, we wanted to have the like better characterization, like what's going on with this lady. So we were, we advised the MRI in this situation. Okay. So question to Paul and Jason, like what's, I mean, you, you see a number of sprains in your practice, right? And do you see cuboid stress or cuboid tenderness? This patient are having pain lingering for a longer. Yeah, I can take that one, Ashish. I mean, yeah, I've seen this a lot. Where I mean, it's usually that that patient that had you know it seemed like a fairly uh, straightforward uh, 
lateral sprain that, you know, I'm not one to MRI these, those patients very, very uh, often, unless I'm really suspicious of a uh, associated, you know, tendon injury or, you know, chondral injury. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait, you know, with a lot of lateral sprains, you know, six, six weeks uh, at least. Um, but yeah, I've certainly, I've seen a number of these, uh, seems like recently, uh, where, yeah, you do the MRI and they've sure enough, they've got an occult cuboid fracture, a lot of, maybe even just a, you know, stress reaction or something in the bone, but, um, yeah, that, uh, you know, clearly wasn't evident on their injury x-rays, but, uh, you know, it is when we get the MRI. Okay. Uh, swap now. Yeah, so uh, the MRI came out as a uh, insufficiency uh, stress structure of the cuboid in the proximal part. Mostly, uh, uh, we we can also see the uh, patient clinically. She was having the KO virus, uh, pretty pretty uh, significant KO virus. But she was 79 year old, and we uh, wanted to do less and wanted to relieve her pain. So we planned for doing a subcondral plasty and uh, using a bone substitute to augment the, uh, the stress vector site. And here are the uh, post-op images. And she really did very well. We basically uh, uh, keep these patient non-weight bearing for uh, three weeks and followed by the gradual transition through the boot and with the ankle brace. And she did really very well uh, after this surgery. So uh, my, my question, Paul and Jason, like, let's say if this patient, three months history, the, it's complaining pain, 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 and came with MRI and seeing this picture, you see this picture at three months or four months, how do you approach for this patient? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. And so I, I, I love what you did, but I, I don't have a lot of experience with subchondroplasty. I would probably at three months have called it a non-union and used a bone stimulator for a patient with MRI findings of a stress fracture um, and no other radiographic signs of collapse. Uh, so I, my, my go-to at that point is typically a bone stimulator. Okay. Uh, Jason, do you see patient with unresolved pain coming at like three months, four months, cubert stress reactions? Sort of unmute myself. Yeah, I, I've certainly seen this uh, Ashish, and I, I kind of agree with uh, Paul. I, I typically try something conservative, like like a bone growth stimulator, even though the the data is pretty mixed on those. Um, you know, I've not done a ton of the um, you know uh, subchondroplasty or um, um, you know these allograft you know injection type uh, procedures for these, but I certainly think it's an option if you've got somebody with you know unresolving uh, marrow marrow edema or bone stress reaction there yep i mean I, I also pretty i would say like you know so far three or four patients like this i use a bone stimulator but like uh always this patient by the time they came uh, i mean already had used pretty much everything out of the whatever we can think about you know and surprising that two weeks she came hey i'm not hurting i said that's great you know so I mean, I guess Bob Anderson's paper about the keyboard stress fracture and the subchondroplasty, I mean, uh, they, they do a fair bit of at a time. And, you know, so I, I was hesitant to do this, but it, it was surprisingly for this age group to make her to get out of the boot at four months. She was the happiest person, you know, so uh, we did this. Uh, the next case, uh, swap now. Yeah, uh, so here's my... Next case. Uh, so this was a 20-year-old male who had a history of fall. He tried uh, doing suicide and uh, he, he was like uh, otherwise normal guy with BMI 22.5, non-smoker and non-diabetic. Uh, this was an isolated injury. Uh, it was close and uh, he had uh, this tenderness and deformity of the lateral uh, hind foot and the midfoot with the middle side of the bruising. So, do you, uh, these what are the investigations? Yes. What investigations would you like to go for for this patient? Do you do CT or MRI for this acute? So we did the CT scan for this guy, 
and we figured out that there was a fracture line, which there was a kind of a nutcracker kind of fracture, and also had the fracture of the uh, fifth metatarsal base. You can see the fracture line in the sagittal plane. I have put this four, uh, four section over here. Uh, the most right one is showing this uh, depression of the fourth metatarsal base fracture. The second one is showing the uh, fracture of the cuboid. There are axial section and the coronal section showing the fracture line in a different different pattern. So it was a pretty classical uh, nutcracker kind of uh, fracture of the cuboid. <clears throat> So we plan to do the ORIF uh, as uh, we know that uh, cuboid is a cornerstone of the lateral column and the uh, principle includes the maintenance of the articular congruity and the length of the lateral column with the stability of the joint. Uh, pretty much standard um, approach. Uh, we went through the dorsolateral approach for the cuboid. Uh, we distracted the joint. Normally we use the Hinterman uh, in the fifth metatarsal. Uh, it goes, it can go from the fifth metatarsal to the fourth metatarsal base. The other pin goes into the anterior process of the calcaneus. Um, because there was some uh, depression of the joint, we basically elevated uh, through the periosteum uh, the, um, and reduced the tarsal metatarsal joint. Um, from there, we uh, temporarily stabilized it with K wires. Uh, he was young and uh, we didn't see any use of the uh, uh, additional bone graft in this case and we went ahead and fixed it. Uh, the important thing uh, in these cases uh, that my mentors uh, tells me every time that uh, always check the stability of the uh, tarsal metatarsal joint. If you don't feel like it is unstable, you go ahead and keep the X fix on. Uh, you can put X fix or you can do a bridge plating kind of uh, situation over there, but this guy was uh, fairly stable in um, tarsal metatarsal joint and calcaneus cuboid joint. So we um, we uh, close this uh, wound, and here here yes. is the uh, so a swap the, quest, question to you is um, we we see such a wide variety of cuboid fractures. Like you know, uh, what's the given consideration? that you say, okay, I want to go and do the ORIF of cuboid fractures. What are the indications that you see? Yeah, so uh, fairly the shortening of the cuboid. These patients, uh, uh, they have they develop the tarsal metatarsal joint arthritis because of this uh, joint depression anteriorly, and they are very unstable. And they, if we don't fix them, we don't uh, maintain the length, they go in the abduction and uh, uh, they, they are having the arthritis, they are having the pain. So um, just because the cuboid is a cornerstone, uh, it need to maintain, we need to maintain the length. So that's the main indication of the surgery. Also, it is very important for the stability. This is the joint, this is the bone, which is the connection between the chew part and the um, uh, frank joint area. If this is, uh, not maintaining the length and the weight, then the uh, patient is going to really have the midfoot arthritis uh, later on. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll switch to, for the last 12 minutes, we'll switch to the Taylor's fractures case presentation. Thank you, Swapnil. Uh, so uh, we'll have just a few slides. We will, I mean, we have a few number of cases, but we'll go over just a few cases step by step. So this is, thank you everybody. And I'm thankful to Swapnil and my other colleagues at UAB to share their, uh, you know, their patient's fracture slides or the fracture pictures and presentations and stuff. Okay. And one second, the first case we are talking about. So this is a 74 year old female, status post MVC, BMI 31, she's a status post cabbage and non-diabetic. I mean, uh, Jason, do you see, how do you differentiate? Do you, do you have any different protocol for the patients you're addressing with diabetes or without diabetes? I mean, yeah, for sure. We always harp on the residents, you know, on these patients, you really need to get a, um, really good, uh, neurologic exam. So I'll have them, you know, we'll check monofilament, uh, testing and so forth. We know those patients are, 
a lot higher risk of uh, complications, uh, you know, uh, neuropathic collapse and so forth. Um, you know, when they do have, uh, you know, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, I think too, uh, really getting a really good vascular assessment, uh, which can be hard when they come in, you know, with an acute trauma, if they, if they don't have good uh, uh, pedal pulses, um, you know, we, we've got a really, uh, aggressive vascular group here who will, will get involved and um you know if they're if, unless there's an emergent to get into the or we'll oftentimes they'll um you know and you know, obtain um, you know non-invasive vascular studies and you know even uh arteriograms if necessary to um try to optimize them okay uh question uh, paul to you like you know that when we went to the medical school or residency we used to go and fix the talus fracture emergently in the middle of the night then the FAI paper came up around same time when we were fellowship together that, oh, no, you can wait, you know? So what are the cases that you go and do emergent basis or you can wait? Yeah, I think it may be a little different for me at, at a smaller town, um, but if I get a call from the on-call doctor and, and they're gonna call me for a Taylor's fracture uh, and let's say that, you know, it's, the daytime, um, I'll just go do it. I mean, I, I don't have a trauma team. We don't have a trauma room. Every day of my life is scheduled from eight to five, either in the OR or in the clinic. Uh, and so if I get a call, I'll go do it that night because why not? And there's no better time to do it. And the patients really appreciate it, especially if they do go on to get osteonecrosis or osteoarthritis, and they know that you came in to see them at uh, eight o'clock at night and did their tailors that night to help them get the best result. Um, they appreciate that. And I think that goes a long way when they do have a bad outcome uh, that they know you tried hard. And so I generally will go in. If it's two or three o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna put that off to the next night. Um, but I, I will go in that day if I can. Okay, I, I agree. And my question, uh, Jason, you are on trauma center, let's say, and this patient came I mean, do you, what, what's, you, you know that you're swamped with like 20 cases on that day. So what will you do? You, you go and CT and RIF or you do X fix followed by CT or RIF or how do you approach this? So I think, you know, if I've got, um, and Ash, for some reason, I'm not seeing what the audience is seeing here on, in terms of the slides, but, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if you've shown the AP and the lateral radiograph on this or not, I, you know, this patient to me looks like there's, you know, some um, on if their radiographs show, you know, maybe just a little bit of subluxation, but not frank dislocation. You know, I might, I might think about just going and getting the C, you know, splinting them, you know, in the, in the ER, uh, getting a CT on them, and then going straight to Aurea versus, um, you know, X fix first. I think if they're grossly dislocated, obviously, I think uh, if their soft tissues don't look great, then I would X take them for X fix and then get get the CT. Um, after the X-Fix uh, to start planning the more definitive treatment. Okay. So in, in this patient, if you look at this oblique view as well, along with the talus, which talus fracture, which we are able to see in the lateral view, uh, this patient had the more like a calcaneus fracture medially, you know? So like, look at this, like, you know, it's a little disrupted there. And, and again, like taking the call at GOB main hospital, but there are 10 other emergencies waiting. So yes, we don't know when I'm going to fix, but I, because of the swollen skin and all the stuff, first of all, uh, we always like to take them, put the X fix. I like to reduce the fracture or dislocation. And at the same time, like, you know, I use some k fixation without compromising the, skin condition, opening that and putting the X fix. And then after putting the X fix, like, you know, then what happens, like, you know, then we do CT scan, you can look at the CT scan here, like, you know, it's, it's decent, but like when you look at the second slide, you know, there is a disruption more like immediately, you know, laterally looks pretty decent there, but medially. And then after that, like, you know, then when my trauma partner or trauma foot and ankle partner, like in the following day, like, you know, uh, when it's not busy, they took the patient for the surgery. And they did like the Taylor's fracture ORIF here for this patient. Like, you know, this is all intrap imaging. They can see that after fixing the Taylor's, they did not go behind the calcaneus medially. It was more medial sustenacular tali fracture fragment. And they just put the K-wire fixation more of like, you know, 
it was subtalar subluxation or dislocation and 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 more of like you know it looks like this way at a three months follow-up i mean tailors looks healed but like you know even at the same time when you are seeing at the six months follow-up you can see a good bit of subtalar arthritis you know and because yeah. the whole yeah, Ashish, can you push the uh, slides i don't yes. think it's broadcasting okay the, which underneath is... next ashish there might be a you see something that says push slides okay push to the audience okay perfect can you can you see that fixation slide here the three months follow-up imaging yes. yes so so this is the three months follow-up imaging and uh, this is what it looks like you know that it was done they did not go behind any calcaneus fracture stuff but when you look at it now this is at the six months follow-up imaging it, it's more of like look at it like you know when you see the broadens view with that subtle arthritis there but again 74 year old female diabetic patient right um she's she's neuropathic and she's able to tolerate this pretty well overall right now you know so so next let's let's move to the next one this is like 30 year old male status post mbc bmi 28.37 smoker this is very common in alabama smoking and the high bmi opiate disorders non-diabetic and this is the patient came to the er when we are taking the all trauma series this is the x-ray it looks like you know uh paul you have worked in the military and you have seen this during the military or how do you triage this patient yeah um so i think there's there's no choice here he's a 30 year old you gotta get this thing better um and so um i will go into the er and I'll, I will give it one pull in the ER. I'll, uh, I'll load the joint with some saline and some marcaine um, in the ER, plus or minus any sedation that's available to me. And I'll see if I can't just, you know, pull it. But I think you all know it's a Chinese finger trap, right? The, the more you pull, the tighter it gets and uh, it's not going in. But I will, I will make an attempt and every once in a while that works. If that attempt doesn't work, I'm going to the OR to do an open reduction and external fixation on this one and the CT scan after the external fixation. Okay. Uh, Jason, would you change any differently here for this patient? We got one minute, guys. Yes. No, I, I agree with what Paul would do. Okay. So this is what, like, you know, I, I agree with uh, Paul and Jason, both of you said, like, you know, that uh, the patient was taken, like, you no know, reduction was attempted and it's pretty reasonable if you look at overall and the x fix was applied for this patient here and when you after that we did the ct scan uh for this patient you know and this is what it looks like you know uh, not the best looking but still it's a pretty manageable there and then after this like you know we took the patient for the surgery definite fixation as we learned from uh, jason like you know having the option of medial and lateral both of the approaches for this patient and uh, look at this is what it looks like with the more of the medial lateral plating for this patient so again like you know this is uh, we we all know these are the crazy patients and not the best outcomes and stuff but this is what we have to deal like as i hope like all of us learn the basic principles uh, of the talus and cubert fractures thank you so much awesome. Salim. awesome thanks ashish thanks everybody for your your time we really appreciate it